At the end of a revival service, the evangelists invited people to come forward if they wanted someone to pray for them. And about midway through the line of people moving forward was an imposing, intimidating looking man. And when the minister asked about his prayer request, the burly guy said, Reverend, I need you to pray for my hearing. The evangelist quickly placed his hands on the man's ears and prayed fervently for restored hearing. When the minister finished praying, he looked the man squarely in the eyes and he shouted above the choir strong singing, how's your hearing now? The man loudly replied, I don't know yet, preacher. My hearing ain't till next Wednesday at the courthouse. <laughs> Proverb we're looking at this morning is Proverbs 18, verse 13. Proverbs 18, 13. If you have your own copy of God's word, you can turn there. One verse that teaches this. If one gives an answer before he hears it, it is his folly and shame. This is a proverb about jumping to conclusions. Has anybody ever jumped to a conclusion? Have you ever formed an opinion about something or like that evangelist taken a course of action in the absence of all the facts? Have you ever rushed to judgment on a matter? Have you ever predicted what a person would say or how a person would behave before that person even had a chance to speak or respond. Those are all examples, and they are common examples of the behavior Proverbs 18.13 is steering us away from. We should not be deciding an issue before we hear all the facts that we can. Imagine a judge who takes to the bench in an early morning case. She calls the court to order. She looks at the accused and says, guilty. That's ridiculous, right? The judge isn't going to do that. There's no justice in that. Or just as silly, imagine the same judge calls the court to order, invites the prosecutor uh, to present his case. And when the prosecutor is finished, and only the prosecutor, the judge says, sounds to me like he did it. Guilty. That isn't going to happen either. It'd be a pretty poor judge who would do something like that. Because the process of justice requires that all sides of a case be heard. And only then can a fair and a reasonable conclusion be made about a situation, about guilt or innocence, about culpability or pardon. There's even a proverb for this truth. If you look a little deeper into Proverbs 18 to the 17th verse, you'll note it says something along these lines. The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. The Living Bible translation of this verse says, any story sounds true until someone tells the other side. Any story sounds true until someone tells the other side and sets the record straight. That's one of the reasons why when we read about uh, church discipline in Matthew 18, where somebody is sinning and they will not repent, before that issue can be brought to the church, it must be confirmed on the testimony of two or three witnesses. The issue must be confirmed. That's why Paul, in his instructions to Timothy on how to manage the church, says, you shall not entertain an accusation against an elder except it be supported by two or three witnesses. It isn't just one side of a story that gives you the whole story, is it? And we know that very often half-truths are half-lies. So to understand something completely, we have to hear as much as we can about it. And to our proverb this morning, to give an answer, that is to react or to draw a conclusion, to weigh in before hearing, well, that is folly and that is shame. And those words, folly and shame, mean foolishness and disgrace. So the one who gives an answer before uh, he hears everything, the one who forms his opinion before he knows the story, behaves foolishly, behaves disgracefully. The message paraphrase translates this thing even more forcefully. It says, answering before listening is both stupid and rude. I can believe I read that in the message. Like, really? <laughs> stupid and rude? That seems so strong. Those are not things that uh, we would aspire to being stupid or rude. And certainly, 
Those are not charges that we would hope anyone would ever really bring against us. And if they did bring those charges against us, we'd hope there wouldn't be enough evidence to convict. Because we don't want to be that way. But, but if we give an answer before knowing the facts, that's exactly how we're being. So what is the way of wisdom? What is the right way? What is this proverb prescribing? Well, instead of drawing hasty conclusions based on partial information, James 1.19 teaches that if we're going to be quick with anything, it should be to listen. If we're going to be quick with anything, it should be to listen. James 1.19, let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Listen to that formula. Listen to that progression. Let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. We, we hear that and probably can recognize right away how easy it is to get that messed up, how easy it is to get that out of order, to get convoluted with that. We hear something and we, we react in anger. We, because we're angry, we begin to speak. Once we start speaking, we're not listening anymore. You agree with that? I mean, if you're talking, you're probably not listening. It's so easy to get these pieces messed up, say that something that we value be, gets threatened or some expectation that we have is not being met. And we get agitated about that. We start to get angry about it. And again, we start to talk about it. We start to grumble or complain or we, we add some commentary to the circumstance. And once again, we're not listening. What's the thing that seems to, to get left behind in all of these? It's, it's the idea of listening, hearing. So James gives us a proper order in which to behave. He says, be eager to listen. Be much less eager to share your opinion. And be very patient as the story develops. That's the gist of this simple proverb, although it does seem to have some cultural relevance, I think, because patiently waiting and being quick to listen and slow to speak don't seem to be valued, at least not perhaps like they used to be. We are, in fact, being asked to make up our minds based on memes and based on a new cycle that goes faster than any of us could ever keep up with in order to thoughtfully and critically evaluate what it is that we're being taught or told. We're being pushed to move at a very fast pace, which leads us to react and sometimes to not react in good ways. The church has to be different than this. God calls us to be different than this, right? We are, we are not supposed to be like the world. We are not supposed to be conformed to the pattern of the world. So if people aren't listening, and if people are uh, quickly and easily offended, and if people are spouting off all over the place, well, just because they're doing it doesn't mean that we have to. In fact, we should not. How might this proverb translate practically for us in 2020? If we were to phrase it in the positive, it would be something like this. Listen before you answer. Listen before you render judgment. Listen before you give a verdict. So how might it practically play out in our lives? Well, let me suggest a few things. First is this. Pause before you reply to that offensive email. Just pause. Take a breath. Count to 10. Count to 100 before you reply. To that offensive email. How many of you have read something in your inbox and has immediately stirred you and you turn around and you hunt and peck your response and you hit send. And thus begins a war of words. And if you're like me, if you have the technological prowess that I do, once that's sent, it's gone. Like, I have no idea how this works, but I know once it's gone, it's gone. I cannot get it back. So pause before you reply to the offensive email. Don't give your answer until you know the whole story. Or, along these same lines, think before you like a controversial post. Many people are on Facebook, and they like the people that they are on Facebook with and their circle of friends, and therefore they are inclined to like what their friends say. But I want to suggest that it's possible to like somebody and not like what they say. 
And so we shouldn't be automatic with, the, oh, this person posted that, so I'll just like it. That's not good business. That's not good practice. You're not thinking about it. We have a little bit of a rule here we, we talk about in our leadership team. If Jesus wouldn't like it, don't you like it. Right? If it's, if it's controversial at all, if you can look at something that's posted and you can say the Lord wouldn't approve of this, if Jesus won't approve of it, then we can't be approving of it. No matter how much we like the person who's posted it, if it's controversial, if it's hurtful, sometimes in a political season we get carried away with this stuff because we read something, it kind of lines up with our way of thinking, we think it's humorous, we want to like it or forward it or share it or whatever you do with that stuff. And that's not helping the cause of Christ, is it? In fact, that may be keeping some people from the Lord. And that's just us giving an answer to something before we really thought it through. Stop before you share a half-truth. Probably most of us are guilty of this at some point or another. We've got a piece of information and we share it. We don't have the whole truth. We just have a piece of it. And so we give our answer about it. We share with somebody about it. I had this same, this happened to me this week. I heard somebody came and they told me a half-truth. And I'm listening to them and I said, that doesn't make any sense. That could, it couldn't have happened that way. That doesn't make any sense. Well, I, I think that's how it happened. I'll check with so-and-so, and I'll get back to you. What are you doing? What are you doing? You're telling me something, and then when, I, then when I press you a little bit, you're admitting that you don't really know what you're talking about, so you're going to go back to the source. But listen, that cat's out of the bag. You've already done that. You're, you've already put that out there. When we share a half-truth, we're also possibly sharing a half-lie. When we, when we portray something in one particular way, we, we may be giving somebody an altogether wrong impression. We may, be, we may be asking someone to draw a conclusion about someone or something in the absence of all the facts, which is exactly what this proverb tells us not to do. So why would we want to encourage anybody to do that, let alone do it ourselves? Because if we're not careful with this little nugget of wisdom, and isn't it easy to read over these things? Isn't it easy just to look at that and just, oh, yeah, that's nice. But slow down and think about how this impacts you. Because if we're not careful with this simple behavior, listening before we answer, we might find ourselves on the wrong side of issues or treating someone in a way that they do not deserve to be treated or getting upset over something we've no reason whatsoever really to get upset about. Or as Proverbs 18.13 predicts, looking foolish or behaving shamefully. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. That's what the proverb teaches, so that's the end of the teaching on the proverb. Having said that, I have a question for you. What do you think about 2020? Be careful. That is a trap question. Because 2020 is not over yet. Why would we give an answer before we've heard? Why would we render a judgment before we have seen? But we have, and we do. And if we're not careful, we will. It's easy to complain, it's easy to be upset. It's easy to question why this person wants that and this person wants another and why this part of the government says that and this one says another to get on one or the other sorts of bandwagons, give an answer as if we know. It's easy to be just plain frustrated. We can't do what we normally do. We can't do it how we normally do it. And to be honest, that's certainly one of the lessons that I have come to grapple with is one of my biggest problems with this whole pandemic is I can't do what I want to do the way I want to do it. Oh, isn't that awful? <laughs> it sounds so bad when you say it that way, but isn't there just such an in intrinsic selfishness in us and we want to be the sovereign over our whole lives and we want to control everything and have you learned yet? You're not in control. Early on in this thing, a, a medical official stood up and he said, he said, the, the, the trajectory of this virus depends on us. 
You know, this, what, what we do, how we respond to this, and whether we get over this depends on us. And I'm listening to that on TV going, I don't think so. Because if it depended on us, it would be all over. But we don't have control over this thing, do we? But people are telling us that we do. And I'm not saying we can't be wise and smart and mitigate and all that stuff. I'm just saying in terms of ultimately what the heck is going on? a lot of negativity out there about it, a lot of, I miss this, and I want that, and I, a lot of anger, I can't have this, and I can't have that, and again, what is going on? What's missing from the dialogue, the, the narrative, that at least on a national level, and certainly uh, in a news cycle or anything like that, what's missing is a perspective of God at work. So where is God in this thing? And what is he doing? And if we could just pause for a second and slow down and think that through. What is God up to? And or, what has he been doing? We can hardly be accused of being a really reflective people. We move so fast. But hasn't the Lord been teaching you something over the last five or six or seven months? Haven't you been hearing his voice in ways you hadn't heard it before or listening in ways you might not have been listening? God is at work. He's speaking. He's teaching. It's not all bad. In fact, some of it's really good. <laughs> and some of it is needed. Very much needed recalibration of how we approach to life, even how we view it, where it comes from, why we have it. These have been very, very stressful, hard times. But they have also been good times. I want to ask you to share with me if there might be something in particular that the Lord has laid on your heart during the last six months. If there's a lesson that you're learning or a lesson that you've learned, or a point that he had to make, I want to hear from you. What is God doing in your life? And I want to caution you that I'm very prepared to stand here during an uncomfortable silence until you're willing to share with us what God is up to, because he is up to something. And every one of you, and in, in on us as a church, he's at work. So what, what are you learning? What are you, what are you taking away from this? What has been challenged or what is new in your thinking? Mandy. How, how easy to be pulled away from God. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Very easy to be pulled away. Yes, John. Yeah, how blessed we were and, and didn't even really know it. Right? So for sure, there's a heightened appreciation for this and a heightened appreciation for families looking at each other across the dinner table and not, not necessarily having to go in, in a hundred different directions, being pulled all over the place. <laughs> My wife looked at me a few months in and she looks and she goes, you know, I don't hate this, <laughs> which is a compliment, by the way, for, you know, to, to me, because we had to spend all this time together. I don't hate this. Yeah. 
Yeah, one day at a time. Oh, my heavens. Plan, next plan, plan A, B, C, D, plan W. Yeah, it really, it, it, it gets to patience, doesn't it? It, it, it? it causes us to be patient and reliant upon the Lord. Because whatever's going on, it'll be his plan. But my plans find perspective. Other things the Lord is teaching you, changing you, taught you, challenged you. The illusion of control. kind of reminds me of, of the end of the book of Job. When anybody wants to get too big for their britches, Job can just sort of ask them where, where God can ask Job and can ask us, were you there when I set the boundaries? How much control do you think you have? Yes. Yes. No, no respecter of persons. Other lessons, other thoughts that the Lord is pressing on your heart? What's that? I'm glad you live in Maine. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes, he is. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Prayerfully, this is turning people to the Lord and realizing our limitations. And I know, I know it is. I know it is. That's right. It's either a trial or a temptation. A crisis always presents a danger and an opportunity. And uh, we focus a lot on the danger, but it's okay to look at that opportunity too. And that's where we see God shaping our hearts and our lives and changing us and helping us to walk by faith in him and showing us what we really need and what we don't need what we can get along without. Right. Because it's to not be afraid, to learn how to live and not be afraid, not be anxious about anything. You remember when this I remember when this first started, and we didn't really know what was in front of us. And uh, you go to the store and come home, and do I need to take a shower now? Do I need to wash these clothes? Oh, my goodness, I used my Instacart. I did no debit card, and I didn't uh, wash my hands, I think. And I probably touched my face. <laughs> yes, this is uh, I, I need more soap. Yeah, so we should be wise and we mitigate and, and we should follow science as best we can that way to be smart, but we don't have to live in fear. We don't have to live in fear. We have to trust God. The, the highest end of living is to glorify God. It's not surviving, right? The key isn't surviving. The key is living well. The key is giving God glory. Wherever, that, wherever your life takes you, you can always do that. That's kind of powerful and kind of freeing. All right. Well, I just wanted to spend some time talking about some of that, and I know that's just the tip of the iceberg, but just to say, this story is still being written. So I would caution us all about giving an answer to it, because I think the Lord is potentially planting seeds of revival I, I know the Lord is turning people to him. I see him galvanizing his church. Uh, I see good things happening. And uh, so the verdict is out, not in. 
keep their eyes open for what God is up to and praise him and appreciate him for what he's doing, even in these hard, hard circumstances.